Okay, everybody, here we are, our rest here for Shop Talk. We have Mr. David Roeder, Mr. Mike Rowley, and Mr. Dan Bly. And you guys, these two have been on before. Mr. Roeder has not. So we're going to start with uh, Mr. Roeder here and talk about uh, his journey through... Uh, blacksmithing and bladesmithing, where he started, why he started, how he started, and the ins and outs, of, and what he thinks about Forge and Fire. So how you been there lately, Mr. Roeder? Uh, yeah, I suppose. What actually brought you, I know the story, and a few of us probably know the story, but what actually brought you into blacksmithing and bladesmithing? So, growing up, uh, I was about 16, and I had a guy down the way from where I lived, and uh, in the distance, I could hear an anvil getting used from time to time. Someday down the way, I uh, ended up discovering that it was a guy that made knives. And so it all started for me with a little um, uh, concrete nail knife that he had forged out, pounded out, you know, something for kids, you know, yeah. something dumb. And uh, I went over talk with him and I asked if I could watch him make a knife. That was it for me. So, I mean, for the knife making part, I was hooked instantaneously. Dan got, got to forge his knife today, first time ever. Yep. So, what was your feeling when you were your first time forging that knife? Well, I didn't know what I was doing, so I was kind of very cumbersome. Yeah. Awkward. But you felt like, this is great. Oh, yeah. When I was done with my first knife, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, until you had to go grind it. No, even after I made it, I ground it, I forged it, it was made out of a, a, a file, a Nicholson file, and I ground it on my dad's little 3 by 21 Black & Decker belt sander, and uh, put it together, put an antler on it, put some brass on it, made it a you know, guard and whatnot, and now that was the coolest thing in the world. So, well, being a, a newcomer, day one, what was your feeling when you were doing it? exactly what he just described. <laughs> Cumbersome, didn't know what I was doing, but we were making a knife and... Having fun. Just having fun. Yeah. You you were born and raised in Florida, right? Well, I was born in Tri-Cities, but I was raised down in Florida. Okay, so what brought you back? Uh, my mother's side of the family. So uh, I wanted to see more family. I wanted to be around more family. In Florida, there wasn't really anybody except for my dad. So uh, I wanted a change of environment change of scenery so up i came and the rest is history yeah i've been here ever since 1998. <laughs> so how long have you been uh, practicing um blades with it? oh I, I started swinging a hammer in 1996 september of 1996. and non-stop since then it has been non-stop yeah i mean there's been a, a hiatus once for a few months here and there over the years but i've always fallen back on it I've always kept at it. You currently don't have a working shop right now. No. But uh, that hasn't really slowed you down at all. No, I, I got a buddy that he's letting me use his place. Yeah. So I still make knives. You are in the process of going for your master smith. Correct. And we were supposed to do it this year, but Correct. with COVID and everything. Yeah. So, I mean, that would be my next question is, is what, how has COVID actually um, hit you? And it would be that you're not a master smith right now. Yeah, I mean, essentially, the way that things were trending last year, uh, 2019, um, I was going to be shooting for my master smith this year. I was going to make all my knives up and then test uh, this year. But since February hit, um, it was kind of the, the prelude to bad times. Yeah. And then in March, everything hit the fan, you know, with everything. everybody freaking out and whatnot. And so it canceled off everything for this week. Now, Dan, have you seen anything different since the COVID stuff, or have you had an uptick in any sales? Uh, we've, we've decreased. You've actually decreased. But just because we haven't been doing events and getting out, I mean, we've still had it in some orders yeah. in, but not as many as what we would have had if we would have been out and about doing yeah. shows. So. What about you, Mike? Have you seen an uptick in sales or a downtick or sideways no, or it's, upside down? Well, since most of my sales have been online stuff yeah. um, hasn't really changed that much although the people who are actually coming over to the shop have 
decreased quite a bit. Probably what about you, Bert? How's has, has your sales, you know, changed at all? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I like I was telling Mike here earlier. I was like, you probably make more knives to sell than I do. Um, I don't really have but a handful at a time. Yeah. He's got like waiting lists and stuff with people. Tool wise is is. You know, you and I both kind of started working with this, and you have too, Mike, using very substandard grinding equipment, floor sanders and 1x30s and, and sometimes a damn file if we have to. Now, if you had to do it all over again, would you still go that route with with working your way through the, oh, absolutely. the tools and, yep. and, and doing it the long way? I always, I always tell people if I do a knife making class, I always tell people having the rudimentary nothing to start, it helps you it helps you respect down the line when you've done this for a while, having the nicer equipment. It, it makes you appreciate that. Yeah. And you know, better tools, better quality of work. Um, it, it really does stand true because if you're buying four thousand or you're spending four thousand dollars on the grinder uh, and you make substandard work you're gonna have this thing, this, this this prelude that, well, my knives ought to be better because I have this really fancy knife. Well, if you don't know how to use that machine, then what were you doing buying it? Yeah. So if you start with nothing and you work your way up, as you progress better, yeah, absolutely. It's it's, it's the only way to go in my book. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I, I, I saw Mike shaking his nod on his head, and he'd probably agree too, even a year of mechanic and, and a metal fabricator, but you, you didn't start your 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 hobby business you know with hey look at that i have everything i want exactly. you know you had to work that's into a, it and that's a like grinding parts instead of cutting parts yeah. now what the equipment does allow you to do that all of us had to struggle with is it allows you to evolve much quicker well too, if you if you start slow and you learn the fundamentals uh, i mean you can you can do the same work with a file down at the big grinder, but you're way less likely to, to screw it all up. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've had I've had knives where I'm grinding away and just a moment of like brain freeze, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm going in the garbage. You know, and if I was doing that with a file, it would. Right, and, good times. Yeah, it's it's great stuff. Yeah. So it builds character. So what do you have coming down? I know we've talked about forge and fire. I know your stance on <laughs> forge and fire. Yeah. Um, and but let's for those that have seen your episodes and watched Forged with Fire, we'll, we'll do the same thing with Mike here in a minute. Um, what is something that you can? Go, I'm waiting to hear his story. Let's give a positive spin first. Oh, okay. And then we'll get on to what really chaps your ass. You know oh. about it. Well, for the Forged and Fire aspect, I mean, I've done the show three different times. And uh, you know the, the show in, in a whole, it's it's great. It's a wonderful experience. Um, it's super fun because you get to play with tools and uh, experience things that not every day you would normally experience and see and, and work with. I mean, they have an entire shop that's fully equipped, and a lot of the guys that go on that show don't even have. Uh, an inkling of that type of machinery. Well, when I was watching it, I would always, I said, why aren't they going and using that? Why aren't they using the, the porta Why aren't they yeah, using, because, why aren't you know, they using that nice Lincoln wire fed welder to its full potential? Exactly. I mean, that's like I said, it's not everybody has that type of, uh, do they have a mill, a mill? They do not have a milling machine. So not even a vertical mill. No, they have a big cool. drill press, but there is no milling machine. Yeah. So. Okay, so Mike, to go with what he says about just taking advantage of, of the, the shop, could be stuff that you've never played with that you might as well take yeah, advantage of absolutely. that if you're going to go on that show. What's your... Well, I, I've been on twice, and they, just like David, you know, uh, was saying, like, I've never run a press before. It's everything I've done by hand, it was my hand up till then. I didn't have a press, didn't have a power hammer, I still don't have a power hammer, but... I was bound to determine win, lose, or draw. I was going to play with the power, power hammer. <laughs> yeah. And that's an yeah. air hammer, right? It's yeah, it is pneumatic. New pneumatic. New pneumatic yeah. Air, yeah. And uh, for me, probably the best part was just uh, networking with different people, uh, you know, making friends with the Smiths on the show. So is that really what the um, show is really, when you're 
an accomplished maker like you guys are? Do you really go in there just to see, meet new people and? I okay. I oh, I went to win. He <laughs> went to win, win <laughs> and he did win. I honestly, I didn't give two shits about winning. I didn't, and I'm not saying that just to you know bring attention or anything. I know I, you're pretty competitive. I did. I'm only competitive against you, cause, <laughs> yeah. but I did not go to the show at all to win. Yeah. I wanted to go to New York because hey, it's a round trip ticket, all expenses paid trip, and on top of that, I get to use a shop that I have not even a tenth of the equipment. In. Yeah. It's an awesome. How the heck would you not want to go on that show if you were selected to go? Yeah. There's no reason anybody should say no if they're asking. Yeah, and I never applied. I never applied. And, and you never applied either. You got found, or, or did you apply the first time? Uh, they, when I got a message on my Instagram, I was posting my stuff on Instagram or Facebook or not, not one of them. But they found you. But they found me. Yeah, yeah so you didn't actually have to apply. They came and asked you. Correct. Yeah. See, that, that's cool. You know, that was I, very flattering. Yeah, it is. Especially the first time you probably were asked. It's probably a cool deal. Yeah, because we were the first ever to be filmed. We, we aired as the fifth episode. Yeah. But we were the very first to ever be filmed, so the paint was still sticky on set when wow. we were there because they had just finished painting the night before. It wasn't sticky very long when they turned those forges on, though. Uh, no, it dried out pretty quick. Yeah. So I liked the early episodes. I think they had the best actual... It wasn't all about, hey, let's go throw some shit in a canister. You get these guys on there and go, I've never done canister. Oh, we're doing canister? I'm so surprised. You know, what, have they never watched the damn show? <laughs> you know, I just don't understand. It. My take is, just depend on what you're experienced in. If you've never done canister, it's going to be really, really hard. If you've never worked a 5160 and tried to move it by hand, I mean, that's pretty tough, you know, it can be. Um, but, I, but I think it's just a game show, and so everybody, like every season, they have to make it more spectacular. Yeah. It has to be more than the last year. It has to be more shocking. I, I can more. see that. I mean, but how would you make it better? I mean, I mean, you can, I, I get it. it. It is a game show. It's a huge change from what you're used to. I mean, you got lights and cameras in your face and you're doing it to time. Nobody does it to time when they're in their own shop. Nobody sits there with a clock on your wall. So what would you do? If they came to you, David, and I'll do the same thing for you, and then we'll ask Dan, because you watch the show. Um, what, what would you change about the all the stages, the first, second, and final part, to make it so it pushed you on every level? It did not look like you were pushed at all your first time on. I remember sitting on the couch, I says, it didn't look like he worked at all. Because no. it didn't. No, because it didn't. So what would um, you do to change that? Um, I guess realistically to change things up it would be um, ask me what I can't do and then make me do that. So I, first, first time in it like that for me, I've never done uh, the canister stuff. So probably would say, okay, you're going to make a canister. If you were coming into it. If I was coming into it fresh and new. So that makes sense. They would get everybody who's never done canister. I mean, and there's ways to check that because they, they look at your the, all your social media posts. So you would just literally say, okay, what is your weakest link? Yeah, and they and place you with three other Smiths that have that same weak link. Uh -huh. I think that's so, outstanding. What about what about you, Mike? Um. I don't know. The, the one thing that I don't really agree with is the short time frame for some of the stuff. I know like two hours for handle is pretty... I mean, that's doable. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're correcting mistakes. Yeah. You know, I mean, we all see on the show these guys, you know, you have two hours to do it and then the fit and finish is terrible. It's like <laughs> yeah. freaking two by four. <laughs> yeah, you're holding it like this and they're trying to test. and So I wish they would do a little bit more and I don't know how this would... See, this where it's a game show, you know, it makes, know. it wouldn't make good, as good a TV, I think, but as a, as a knife maker, if they tested more for fit and finish, you know, yeah. but then that leaves that open to in, interpretation, and if they're, you know, I don't know. No, I'd have won, I'd have won all three times if it was for fit and finish. Yeah. You know, R Rotors was, you know, ask me what I'm not good at or, uh, or what I don't know and put me in that. Mike, yours was just really 
working on fit and finish none of the blades on that show and i've had so many people well they make blades on this show in six hours all the time i'm like yeah but would you want to buy one of those what would they okay i shouldn't ask that question <laughs> yeah because of course they would yeah. because and but they're they're they are not sellable pieces half the time um they're only sharp they're designed to pass tests not to be practical but from a fan's point of view watching it and then seeing just what goes into it from day on your day one making a blade knowing what you know now just the the basic necessities of this is how you swing a hammer this is you know how it needs to sit on the anvil how you need to hold the tongs you know oh shit that's hot don't touch it you know type of deal what would you change from a fan's point of view i would like to see uh maybe not necessarily what your weakness is but if you don't have a press or a power hammer put get a group of those people together and you do it the old-fashioned way you use a hammer and an anvil and that's it so what and, what would you guys think of that if you went on the show next and you couldn't use Oh, I'd be perfectly uh, I'd be, at home. Yeah, I'd be fine. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Well, most of us that haven't had it for years, and then I know you you have access to one now, but you went years without having one. Oh, yeah. I mean, access. You the same thing. You have access to one now that you built out yeah. of a log splitter, correct? Yeah. yeah. I agree with you, Dan. I, I like that. Girl, huh? You know, because I'm a, I guess you'd say I'm a, I'm a Smith Smith. You know, I have admitted, I admitted this year that I am, uh, my business is knives and my hobby is blacksmithing now and that's just the nature of the beast i wouldn't be a blacksmith and nobody not as not as many people buys hammers and tongs as they do knives so whatever looking at it from what dan just said is is going at it from a smith smith's point of view i like that way more as well because you can pick out the experienced smiths a lot easier and to be honest with you a lot of times <laughs> the best smith doesn't win I mean, let's, let's be honest. I mean, they've sent home Bert Foster, who is like... They don't know how to get out of their own way at times. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Bert is awesome. Yeah. Like, not a little awesome. He's a lot awesome, right? And they send him home, and it, you know, it's... There's a little bit of luck. There's also... Basically, it's the one who makes the fewest mistakes. Yeah. In those three hours. I agree. And that whole time frame is just like... It's not something you do at home. So before we go any further, is there any questions Dan has about the show or just bladesmithing or work in general that uh, you want to ask these two guys? I don't know. It's definitely, you guys definitely have an, an art. It's definitely well out of my... It's easy to watch. It's, it's hard to do. It's definitely easy to watch. When yeah. you physically do it yourself, like you guys shape the blades. There's a lot that goes on. Mine... And technically, this, this isn't your looks, first time, but it is your first time swinging a hammer at one. Yeah, yep. yeah. Because um, you first, did the press one. The first time we did the press one, uh, I do think that you get a better feel with the metal doing with the hammer um, versus using a press. Yeah, yes. I would say anybody that's starting out, and that's like my second, my second time doing this, I would say stay away from the press for a while, get a feel for what the metal's doing with the hammer and yep. anvil. Work and your then, shop. And then go into... I agree. Stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, too, is... Not just the shop, but don't have these grandiose ideas. Uh, I mean, everybody's thought everybody. You probably did. But I started, and I was, I was pretty sure I was going to make the most awesome katana and Conan the Barbarian sword that's ever been made that probably could cut through a car engine, you know. And, uh, and you're, you know, start off with your expectations of making a knife, a yeah. small one. A worker. Yeah. yeah. And maybe a butter knife, and then throw that one away, and then on your like fifteenth one, then it might be kind of okay. You know, I don't know. Um, Fine. And I would add to that too is that like Chris has done, one of who's been doing it for like three years, and he's awesome. putting out and he's putting out work that is as clean as, as David Roder. And but he has. And this brings me to my point is that he has a mentor and you know making leaps and bounds now as as a smith you know um because you're able to well, once again you're, you're not able to necessarily put out better work you're able to to make mistakes quicker and then fix those mistakes and then and and push past those mistakes into something else that's well and honestly too you kind of hit on something that that's how i'm going to go learn some stuff with david here mr roter um 
the way I learn, you know, YouTube University and reading a book and making a bunch of crap and learning how not to do yeah. it and, and stuff, uh, you're going to learn a lot faster and do better work if you do have somebody who can walk you through it. And who, and who isn't going to pull punches with you. Right. You know, it doesn't do right. any good for somebody to inflate you to the point to where because they're afraid that they're going to hurt your feelings. Right. You got to have that kick in the, yeah. in the crotch, so to speak. I agree with that. I mean, having, <laughs> and we never stop learning either. Right. I mean, it's, oh, no. I had, I had Mr. Roder over to the shop because he'd never made an axe or drifted any kind of an axe. But once he did it, it's, it was nothing spectacularly difficult about it. It was just, you know, oh, well, that's pretty similar to what, you know, just drifting a hole. Yeah. You know, it's, it's no different. It, a lot of times, that's all, really all it takes. It's, I mean, I don't have the amount of experience that, that David has, but finding someone that does something that you don't is part of what we do, period, and especially in, in your realm of work as well. I mean, if you're so closed off to never learning from anybody, you're just going to be a dirt clog in your shop, pretty much. Well, I can um, tell you, if this dummy can do it, <laughs> kind of crappy, but still can do it, you can do it, my friend. Okay. We've talked about all the good stuff. I want to hear, I know Dan probably wants to hear some of the the, the cringe, the cringe work worthy <laughs> things. Um, how many times did they make you walk the... Too, too many to count on one hand. Too many. <laughs> the, walk, the walk down the hallway. Yeah, the, the walk of shame. When yeah, you're so I, I walked it, I want to say six or seven times, something like that. I, I don't remember. I know it wasn't, it definitely wasn't anything that could be counted on one hand. <laughs> yeah. sort of, it yeah. was several. Yeah. Um, um, and that's just because I wasn't taking things seriously. <laughs> you're just having fun. I was just having fun. Yeah. What about you, Mike? No, um, I think that three times or four times or something and then they didn't use any of it really yeah because i kept walking it then i was had my pouty face because i don't like losing <laughs> and my rbf you know and uh, kind of walking and then the next time i'm trying to be all like suave james bond looking got my one eyebrow arched you know they're like, no. And then the third time they made me walk, and I looked at the camera right at the end. You're supposed to walk by the camera. Yeah. You know, get that. And I looked right at them and kind of smiled. And they're like, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, we're done. But it was the end of the day, so. Okay, so how, um, another question is behind the scenes. Is how is there like a... From stage one to stage two, is that all in one day, or is it, or do they shoot all stage ones of whatever episodes they're shooting that day, and then they temper overnight and come back the next day, and you got to wear the same clothes? Is that basically it? You got to come back in the same clothes. You, well, you're told you're told to bring three of the same pairs of clothes, whether it be the same shirts or the pants and shirts but three of the same. And so, um, so after- Through the, the power of TV magic. Yes, so after uh, the end of round one, which is technically day one, um, the art girl, she has to take a bunch of pictures of you. And then day two, when you go back, if you make it to day two, the second round, um, their task is to put makeup on you and make you look dirty. Really? Yes. <laughs> So, so yes, so, I have worn so, makeup. So you get up, take a shower, and then you get to the studio, and they basically throw dirt on you. Well, they, they got you know the colored yeah. makeup, you know, to make you look like what their pictures Put are some, of you. Spray from your the day pits before. and everything, and no, they don't go to that extreme. Okay. They didn't have to for me. Yeah. I'm a sweater man. I <laughs> so, Yeah, but it was three pairs of clothing, so you're always wearing something clean. Uh, but they dirty you up for the second day. That's they, funny. They actually for. I have, so they actually made us change out of our shirts. They hung them up and took them with them, and then brought them the, the actual shirt back. Are you so serious? We put, yeah. We put, and it was this dirty and stinky and crust. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it was totally encrusted. But they <laughs> it took a lot of time with Febreze back there. Oh, wow. So it smelled a little nicer, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was not the And then you got to Smith your second round. Now, okay, yeah, when they do. 
here's now I know that the, not everything is done perfect every time. So how many times when they were doing their their reveal did they have to cut and start over before you guys even found out who won? Uh, you're talking like when like, they take the blanket off the. Well, the blanket. The, okay, let, let's start from the beginning. How many times did you guys have to walk into this? To your oh, animals? dude, I. They they do it like I don't know 10, 15 times. Yeah. You have a little green dot on the ground that you stub marked. walk in as you're. Yeah, and yeah. then they they do it a million times until they get what they want. They get, yeah, they, they, they want they, they want, want a million shots of everything. So for when you so you're doing it like it's probably just completely. So you have to put on this happy face that you're there, even if it's the fifteenth oh time. <laughs> First walked out on the set. Did they tell you look around and look amazed? Oh. Like yawn. <laughs> but After the fifteenth time doing it, you're just like, <laughs> can can we get to the work already? Yes. By the time it's all said and done, so I. So you have like. Yeah. By I the time that. you actually get to Smith, you're already there for what six seven hours. Uh, no, not that long. I think probably the first day is one of the longer days. It's a ten hour day. Yeah. And they're they're walking you through all the safety stuff and then interview free pre-interviews and then do, make you do your walk out 22 times and then now is a lot of that when they cut to the judges is that a lot of that redone no so that's what they're saying while you guys are smithing is what's actually while going the, yeah yeah one they you sit in the they have this little at least where we work they're already we dog ass tired this it's called the stew room yeah and you sit and stew and it's just this room plywood and don't you know. don't forget no talking yeah, yeah, and you're still mic'd up the whole time, so you're like, <laughs> hey, David, what would you do on this? And, no, don't, no, uh, don't yeah, talk. Don't talk. You're, you're on ice. ice. So, Remember yeah. ice? Yeah. You're on ice. So we, we'd that's visit, you know, we'd chat about, I don't know, whatever, you know, eat snacks. and. That'd be hard mm -hmm. to not talk about what's... That was way hard. That'd be... Because, I mean, yeah. that's that's what's, that's what we all do when we get together as Smiths. Is, it, it's well, it, even of our little competitions we have when all of us are together. I mean, it's it's never this cutthroat thing. It's it's always no, this. It's hey, always oh hey hey hey, dude! If you do that, you're, that's gonna go bad. So do this or, or something like that. And so that's probably that would be very difficult for me. Coming from, I'm not a teacher by trade, but I'm a teacher in the smithing realm. You are a teacher, so being able to share something that you know that somebody else can benefit for. I mean, that goes completely against you as a person you know being able to pass on something some knowledge you know and then you have to keep your mouth shut because you know they you're now competing against you know, well i was just trying to treat it like survivor <laughs> you know turn everybody against everybody <laughs> well yeah. i i do know when when i went on the second time just kidding, um, the guys that i the guys yeah. and the girl that i yeah. was with um will called me aside and we're still working he's like hey dave what are you doing what do you mean? It's like you realize this is a competition, right? So it's like stop helping everybody because I was helping Ryu, which was right next to me, yeah. and I was helping Kelly, which was right next to me. I, I don't see any problem end. with that, though. I really and don't. No, no, it's great because I, like I said, I didn't. And that care. was your episode you won. Yeah, uh, did I? Your uh, your second one. Did I? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that your second? Night? Yeah, it was the yeah, yeah the key. So I mean, what's the big deal if you're? I, they I mean, just. I think they just want you to be focused on your work but the thing is everybody sees it. that but see they they like that the, the thing is now that's different than what they like to do now they like to see you see all the time they're commenting on oh look at that sportsmanship oh that's so cool this is what this competition's about it's a community you yeah know? well it wasn't it like wasn't you know six seasons ago yeah, it now now it's like even you. it's even uh uh almost like it's it's extra brownie points if if, if you're the one doing that now ryu Everybody knows Ryu's mm -hmm. story. Basically, went on the show so that he could have a bed to sleep in. Yeah, poor guy. And ended up. Well, he didn't. That was his second time on, right? No, his first time on was with you, and then he no. came on again. No, he was on. He was on uh, season one. Uh, later in the shows yeah. of season one, uh, but he came back for when I was on. So this is still one of those goody goody. You know, we're not really getting into the the horror stories yet, but because Ryu is definitely a a look at what the show can do for someone if they make it all the way through. Oh yeah. Because yeah. I mean, he he went from he's homeless to story. to 
world famous. Yeah, he's a successful. You know? And I don't think he's changed too much about how he does things. No, and that's part of the appeal for what he does is that he keeps that same. Yeah, what got him there? Yeah. And, you know, it was just the stuff that he would do, the satellite dishboards with the. And then he still getting, got that, too. Getting the fire yeah. department called on him. And, 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 and it wasn't and, even his house. Yeah, that wasn't even his property. His house is nothing. That was a friend's place because he did not have his own shop. So he, he was going on the show just to get a, a bed. Yep. You know, for yeah. a while. He was sleeping in the tent. No, no aspirations, not even close thinking that he was going to win. So, one of the success stories, one that ever, most everybody associates, you know, good things with Fortitude Power. Um, the other good thing is with, of course, winning. And, yeah. yeah. And then getting that, that, that $10,000 check. The hardest thing probably to do is keeping your mouth shut the whole time. You did a pretty good job of keeping your mouth shut uh, because we didn't, I didn't even I knew you were, I knew you went back on, but it was like what, fourteen months or something yeah. like that. You, you you couldn't talk about it. It was four, yeah, exactly. Because it was it was supposed we were talking about this earlier. It was supposed to be the lead in for yeah, beat the judges. Kind of that transition. Yeah. Okay. Horror stories. The worst thing that has come out of going being on the show, David. Uh, what Mike. Do? Okay, Mike. Yeah. The worst thing. Um, <laughs> and it could be a, a double-edged sword, pun intended, so right, to speak. Right. You know, it could be the worst thing, but also the best thing. I don't know. I, I don't really know. Honestly, I don't really think, like, it was good or bad. I just think it was an experience. Yeah. And so I have a hard time judging good or bad. Um, the hardest part for me was definitely waiting 14 months the episode to air That's nice. and uh, just trying to be quiet and you know you want to talk about oh, it of course yeah yeah when, when we oh, when we found out you were going on the first time I mean you could I could you could tell how hard it was for you to just not give oh, away yeah. stuff and yeah. and a little bit much easier for you to do it the second time I found out well I had to, you know I had to leave work for it and so people were asking me you know why is he gone for yeah. a week or two weeks and this and the second really time a commando was like, Oh he yeah, got, man. yeah the, the president called him in. <laughs> exactly. I had to pilot my Harrier jet from Enterprise, <laughs> Oregon to uh, New York City to save the day. Um, but no, and and that was that was rough. And then the second ep the second time too, I think the harder part was we went in with the expectations of it being a uh, similar format to what it was what it had always been up to that and point. And it wasn't that at all. And it wasn't that at all. And, and we didn't know going in, so they kept saying stuff like, if you don't meet parameters, then we're going to take away your title of Fortune Fire Champion. Uh, if you don't, you know, because of, of the testing, because the way the testing was. Um, and we didn't know we were going to compete against So they really the had you guys on edge. Oh, man, we were wound up tighter than a drum. Yeah, we ready to kill each other. And... Um, you know, not really, but it's yeah. just like... Tension man, was pretty we had, thick. We had no clue. And we didn't know what the testing was going to be. We didn't know we were competing against a judge. We were trying to guess. Um, and then I think probably the hardest part for me was my knife, I think, was... Well, you know, they didn't show the handle breaking. Mm -hmm. Me starting over with about 10 minutes left. And I look up at Will, and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like drilling out that last hole to put the clip in, you know, to make sure there's no epoxy in it, which I didn't get it all the way because the epoxy wasn't set, you know, all this stuff, but, um, so my knife couldn't be tested and fit and finish wasn't good, but they didn't show any of that stuff, you know, they just, and so if you I was like, putting a handle on yeah, it, exactly, and then it didn't, yeah. you know, it broke and I'm trying to straighten the blade and it's like giving me troubles, you know, and, and, and all this stuff and, you know, they, and I know, I think there's about 5,000 minutes of filming in between for each episode. They have to take 5,000 minutes down to about 40. Yeah. You know, you know, whatever it is. 42. 42 minutes, yeah. And it's like, you know, so I know they're going to lose a bunch of stuff. 18 minutes. Yeah, but I, I wanted, I really, really, really wanted to at least have my knife tested. Yeah. I mean, I wanted see somebody swinging it at something and to be honest we were all really close yeah 
And, and I, I, do, I do agree with the judges. Like, if you look at fit and finish, mine was not as good as the other two. It, just, it wasn't, and I, I realize that. Um, you know, well, and it, I, I have no problem with the way they tested. I really would have liked, though, to have them say, you are going to be eliminated. Somebody is going to be through fit and finish. Yeah, not and just bring us the, back to what you would want to yeah, change. Not just meet the parameters, which you have to do, but we are going, you are going to be eliminated in this next round on fit and finish. And nobody said that, and then they eliminated you because of fit Right, because I'm all about parameters, man, because, yeah. you know, with the threat, and and then, you Push know. Push the boundaries as far as you can to get the job done well, in, in, a, do in a competition a, like that. Yeah, and we had to do a decorative pin, and I was doing like a four-piece handle with, you know, making it a little something, something extra. Well, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have had a solid piece handle with, and I'd have spent Super all slick. the time, yeah. you know, hand sanding, you know, all, everything. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I, I mean, that that's on me too, you know. Yeah, it just but, really brings you back to what you originally said that you would change is if they, it would have totally changed your mindset if they would have said, well, we are judging you on fit and finish. Yeah. It and not just on parameters. Right, right. Because that's, basically what she said I, i'm going towards parameters and this thing's going to get tested well in almost every show before then you really do want to overbuild a little bit i mean yeah. you want to make a robust blade and you want a comfortable handle but it's not necessarily like you're spending you know x amount of time and hand sanding with the scales perfectly flat and you're you know like yeah there's rarely yeah, I want a, it to hold together. I mean, you want to make it nice, yeah. but that's not the test. There's rarely a competitor that gets through all the testing without some sort of damage. Okay. Yeah, I mean, very rare. Um, now, not so much in the um, beat the judges one, because, I mean, those that made it through were already were pretty freaking clean, you know. That's to another end. level, too. Yeah. I mean, it's you're going against program. well. You're going against other people who've won. It's not my life. You know, and you pretty much yeah. know yeah, yeah. that okay. If I get through this, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna have a chance to go against the judge. Um, and so the way you would probably go about it, in my mind, and maybe I'm totally wrong, go about putting this thing together would be slightly different than what you would have done in your initial. What do you think, there, David? Well, I mean, I've always watched from a historic aspect things on this show is that they they put these knives against targets that are really not meant to be you know, introduced yeah. to a knife. I mean, yeah. you don't cut big blocks of ice or big femur bones or this or that or the other. You don't do that with knives. You use saws for that. Yeah. So, you know, when you're making a knife, like Mike said, you got to make it a little bit robust because a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger, a little bit this, a little bit that. Because, a grind on your yeah, head. because you don't know what they're going to do with it, and you got to expect the worst because they like to destroy stuff. Yeah. So It's like when we do our destruction tests, you know. Yeah, you overbuild it's, it's, it. It's, it's the worst case scenario yeah. type thing. Right. Yeah, you overbuild it. So, I mean, like, I, I made my, my Bowie knife uh, when they when they pushed to the, beat the judges, they said that you come with a finished knife. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, my heat treat, my everything was, I could cut a, a army tank in half of that thing if yeah. I wanted to. I made it to do that. Yeah. Um, and it never it never touched anything hard. Now back up here real quick. Now that, that's a completely different format because they gave you, when you go in to a normal um, filming, Mike, um, you have three hours initial judging and then it's now two hours, but it used to be a full, a full six hours for that for between the two stages. And then you're getting um, into the five day, but there's only like what 40 hours of actual work that can be done. Yeah, I think there was the in that first round there was 45 hours. 45 hours. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Your first day is five hours of filming. That lets him get cameras and everything set up and gets gaffer tape all over your WD-40 and yeah. stuff, you know. And uh, and then the interviews and stuff, it always takes longer the first day. So you had the two hour format the first time in the second stage? Or did you have three? No, hours? I had three. Of the so you were still in the six hours for the day, for the, yeah, that, the, the main? The first and then, time I was. And yeah. the five days at your shop? Correct. 
and you had that same exact thing. So you were telling me for this part, and when you came back for that, you know, introducing the people beat the judges All format, right. it was set up. You guys just assumed you were shooting a normal episode, and it was set so everything was the same as it it previously was. Your your the kind of experience you thought you were going to get into. Uh, yeah, with the exception that we were we brought extra clothes, and we knew we were going to film. If you made it through the round, we knew that we were going to film in New York somewhere. Yeah. So it was on. Everything was done in one week for the filming, or ten days, or something like that. And so. And yeah. how many days was it previously? From if you made it when you made it all the way through the finals on your first round, in total, how? long from you know from day one when you first started shooting to the last day like time frame was well they would send us home and then that that varied very a lot on film crew like my film crew got there within two days after i was there i think oh, david so was, it didn't start right away when you got home no no but david's was, was yours that short or yours, yours longer no the first the first time on the show it was about a week and then they show up um, and then the second time on the show, um, no, the third time on the show, it was like almost a month, like three, what? two and a, a half month? weeks. All, well, like two and a half, almost three weeks, I should say. That's ridiculous. Before the camera crew showed up, which was good because I got to learn a lot about what I was making. So, war story, the worst what kind of turned me off was listening to one story that David Roeder told me. And then said, just wait, go watch the episode. So when I watched the episode, it's one they were going on. Um, from Beat the Judges, and it was an absolute shame. It just it, it, it took everything that I enjoyed about the show and basically turned it into a dumpster fire. Because it, it showed it pulled back the curtain right away to show that it was a very biased type judging they they had are they already make the decision prior to what who's gonna win and it's and granted it should be your job to prove them wrong but if they did it with this one they've probably done it throughout the entirety of the show if you don't mind David if you would share your experience in full detail of your last hopefully not the last but of your last time on Sports So I, I was recruited again to return to make the Alcada for a spinoff series called Beat the Judges. Different format uh, from the typical normal, what you would notice from Forge and Fire. Um, they asked if I wanted to do it, and I said, sure, why not? Because that's the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. Sure, why not? I'll come along and do your thing, and okay. So, to start off was to make a buoy knife to start to do your initial testing. You're not making a knife on set. You're coming with a pre-made piece. So I did, and that's that. And I was able to go on to the second round or second level, whatever they call it, where now you go head to head with another individual. So we, we each go home to our own forges and we make our calcutta. And I made mine. And Mr. Fetters, Tony Fetters, he made his. Now, uh, come testing, um, it was uh, Ben Abbott and uh, Doug Markaita. They were the ones that did the uh, preliminary testing on the two knives, on the buoy and on the Falcata. So, with everything, historically speaking... And how many hours did you have to make the initial The Falcata, buoy? oh, the buoy wasn't pre-set for time you had uh, from the time of notice to your um, uh, like a month before filming so I, I think I had like uh, a month and a half almost to make this knife. Oh so you, it was not any kind of jump through? Your... No it was no time parameter yeah. it just make a knife and it needs to ship this is the latest buy. Oh well, that's not bad. So that wasn't bad at all I had plenty of time that's, to be that's nice. That's actually pretty nice. Yeah yeah it was nice. So uh, we go home, we make the Falcata, we go back in for And testing. that's like 25 hours, right? The Falcata? Yeah. Uh, and it was canister. 
Yeah, it was a it was a time crunch. I, I think it was. Yeah, I don't remember. It's, it's kind it was of a, it was a lot faster than what oh, you yeah, really did. Oh yeah, I've never night. seen I've never seen anybody have to make something in that sort of time. I mean, you're talking basically a day. It could have been done in a day. Yeah, it's, I want to say it was 25 hours. Yeah. I, I could be wrong, but I want to say yes to the 25 hours. Um, so we make them, you know, and, and then we take them and send them, and then we go there and we watch them do the testing. So the Bowie knife uh, wasn't an issue. Everything went great. Yeah. But with the Falcata, um, that's where all, you know, crap went downhill. So, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not a sore loser, although production is uh, multiply claimed that I am a sore loser, but I'm not because I really didn't care. You just wanted uh, a fair shot. I would like a fair shot or would have liked a fair shot. So the, the Falcata goes against the ice, no big deal. The, 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 the crap really happens when Doug, who I have heard about in the past not using a sword correctly, um, did bad testing on other people's as well. Um, the, the main initial target was an eight inch foam rubber target that was wrapped in cloth. And uh, Tony and I are standing no more than about probably, I don't know, 15 feet at most from Doug. And um, I'm watching Doug slap the target. Now when I say slap, I don't mean he hit the target. I'm talking, I saw the side profile side. of my knife hit the target. That's a slap, that's an intentional slap. Yeah. So not only one target, but two out of the three. And then the third was a cut, and it was a rough cut, but it cut. Yeah. And when that knife left my shop, shave with it. Mm -hmm. So there's no way, no reason that it shouldn't have cut those foam rubber targets. Other than the fact that he slapped two of them and then he cut the third one. Yeah. Very, very deliberately open. I could see it clear as day of the slap. Um, well, I voiced my opinion and uh, production stopped me and they said, you can't argue with a judge while the judge is conducting the test because when Doug was swinging and we're sitting there filming I'm telling him stop slapping the targets do it right and um, anyhow that went that didn't go too well um, after the fact I got a nice little one-on-one -on -one meeting with a couple of the producers and their attorney um, uh, <laughs> I had, indicating, I had to bring the attorney in yeah it. indicating that um, I, I'm not allowed to uh, argue with their judging and with their testing and with their final say. I can't do that because I've signed that I wouldn't do that. But all they had to do was go back and, and, and look at the at the reel and go. So okay, I man. asked to see the slow motion footage of the test, and they refused access to that. I asked to see my sword, uh, the Falcata, if you call it a sword. Uh, and Tony to see his sword when we initially arrived before and um, we got denied that access as well so anytime in the past two times on the show we've been able to touch our knives and check them and see how they've been shipping yeah. not this time they wouldn't let us come anywhere near our, our pieces so uh, anyhow that was All that right. so I get uh, I get so uh, so anyhow I got I got painted off as a sore loser which really I, I I didn't care I just didn't like the way the testing went because when you're watching it and he's slapping the target I think that's kind of a yeah, I think any one of us would have been like hey that's that's a no, bullshit test buddy that's a bullshit test yeah so um, I I didn't didn't quite know what was going on but I I got to watch the show when it came out and this is where everything kind of I've lost absolute respect for the show I'm not trying to say that it's a bad show I'm saying my own personal view on it is I've lost all respect yeah. for the show. But when I'm watching the show um, on TV, I'm watching Doug actually cut with the end, edge profile of my knife on the foam targets. They did not cut, but I saw an edge profile. Yeah. So when you're watching somebody cut something from a distance, you will see just the back edge of it. But when I was in person, I'm looking at the side profile of it. Yeah, we so, know what the side, what the, what the edge looks like and the spine looks like, and and that looks like. Yeah, exactly. So the fact of the matter that I was not, we, Tony and I, neither of us were present during their retake on the testing, that's 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 just bad. Yeah. That that's a total. That's lack them covering of their ass because they went back and watched the footage and like, oh, shit. Maybe. 
but I just thought that was that was super wrong. So you know, Tony gets to go against the judge to the end. Not a big deal. I don't care. But the fact that my testing wasn't proper, I mean, it could have it could have like had a really crappy cut, and I would have been happy. Because that was also the the episode where Jay had multiple fails. Yeah. So. Uh, so the whole thing from start to finish oh yeah. was just it was we got both Tony and I both got thrown under the bus absolutely thrown under the bus so Tony gets to go to the end Tony goes against Jay Nielsen uh, you have an eight hour window you have to make a canister style uh, sword of this now by the time this. they're filming this you're already on your way home um no I'm at the I'm in the hotel just waiting yeah so because we're time. flying out at the same time okay. so I'm in the hotel while they're doing their filming so I got all of my story firsthand from Tony, which Tony. is the guy that was right there. Yeah. So um, my my thing was having dinner that night with Tony. Um, Jay and Tony make a sword, eight hours, canister style Damascus, this, 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 and this. Jay ends up making a knife, that, that piece, that, that sword, in five hours, because he had a mess up. Yeah. He remade it. In the testing, there was no edge damage, there was no anything in the beginning of the testing of the two swords. When the end came out, Jay Nielsen's sword took a bend because the, they had hit, they hit, hit terracotta and it bent the blade. Yeah. Now, in any other case, at any other time, you'd been booted. Yep. The fact of the matter that Jay Nielsen's handle actually started breaking and falling apart would also have booted anybody else in the world mm -hmm. at any other time. We've Again, seen it numerous times on that show. Tony sword, no edge damage, no constructural defect, everything straight as an arrow. Jay Nielsen, two issues that were major, and he still won. There's no talk of the handle deck. The, there was no handle or no uh, no talk of the handle falling apart um, at all. But that's something that he still won, and yeah. the other sword should have won but didn't. Tony was very upset because he did not disagree, and I, 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 I'm in agreement with him that that Jay should have not won that at all. Yeah. There's two issues, two major issues that would have, at anybody else at any other time, sent you home. But yeah, and, and there's the nothing judge. on Jay. I mean, Jay has no control over oh, no. that. He's no. just a competitor at that point, and he's at the he's at the whim of the producers, just and in, in the, in the show, just like anybody else. So, yep. what we don't want to have happen is that oh well jay's a piece of shit you know oh, no. no 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 not at all jay's a good guy he, he's only it's it's he's there doing a job and and his job was to be a competitor at that point and um um it's out of his hands at that point so um we're gonna let you guys go and watch the show and figure <laughs> it out on your own but this is kind of the backstory about mike's never hasn't had the uh the what the hell moment was that yet? I haven't, uh, I haven't had that one yet. No. Not yet. Um, and hopefully it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, hopefully, and hopefully, David, they, you you get called back on and. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see about that. And get, uh, <laughs> oh, you'll say yes. Uh, you never know. <laughs> okay, other things. I know you have, they're, they're shooting an episode of Alone right now. Yeah. And you have a piece on there right yeah. now. Can you. Without giving too much away, can you share what it is? Yeah, it's a knife. No, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, never, you're not all alone, obviously. I, no. I mean, because we're no, here with you, and, like and you're not. You're alone. not. I mean, you look like a starving pygmy, but I could. But, be. <laughs> I just got done with filming. <laughs> you um, used to be 300 pounds, and <laughs> yeah, I was, I was. I was. I'm a Jared story. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so how did they? And we'll get to you too, because you you have. The thing you, uh, you're going to be going on, and you've been training. Uh, yeah, Mike, I'm, and, I haven't been accepted or anything. I'm just but you've applied. applied. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, Camping. but but you're already a um, a TV talent. Yeah, of course. Fire guy on a lot. You know, cool. I mean, you're you're one of those ones that'll probably be fast back fan favorites in and have champion but specials could, and. I could, wouldn't it be cool though to have like, somebody on there who forged their own knife, forged their own axe. And I, I used to make long bows, make my own long bows and stuff. So make my own long bow. Yeah. I mean that'd be what's that'd funny, be cool, Mike, you know? is before I even knew you were going on, I was telling David Dick because David Spurlock's been trying to get on oh, uh -huh. forever. And, and and he's like the epitome of, you know, oh, yeah, the he, mountain man type personality. 
you know, and, and could could have a conversation with himself for for years and and never I mean, entertain and, himself and, and entertain himself and never <laughs> yeah. go and never go stark raving mad, you know, like you see right. some of those guys out there right. do, and they're like, I gotta get out of here. Um, and, and he doesn't know when to be afraid of stuff, and you know, and so a bear could be munching on his, his lunch and oh, okay, you, know, there, you, know, you know, whatever. Right. But that's what makes David David. Um, but I told David, I says, what you need to do is you need to send in your vid a video of you, and I'll shoot it, and you, and you smithing a knife while you're surviving to go out there, yeah, out right. there. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So finding whatever to make yourself a knife, whether it be a, a rock knife or whatever it is, yeah. you know. And then I found out that you, because Andy Boyd said, well, Mike's smithing a knife right now, oh. making a knife right now to go on the show. And I'm like, Just in case, man. That's Fingers outstanding. Crossed. I mean, so you have a knife that's on there, but you won't be on there. It's from a guy, can you say his name? Uh, no, I got it. That's all right, probably. Okay, so what, what type of knife is it? Oh, it's just a, a knife. I how, don't know. How long? Parameter? Oh, uh, I want to say the blade was about seven and a half. So not overly large? Just no. Nice hunter? Or? Yeah, it was a survivalist type yeah. knife. Um, I think they have a blade limit length of 10 or something, so most guys are under that. So overall length of 10? Well, I don't know. I don't remember the overall, but I know that the blade was, I want to say the blade was seven and a half. Um, you know, my car to handle and... It was meant to be uh, beating the crap out of, yeah. you know. A worker. Hard. Worker. Something something that, that, that he could not die. Yeah, yeah, he had to depend on him to, or you know, that night to save his life. That's you know? cool. And you it, do it, it, and you do a lot of movie stuff too, right? I do movie props. You do movie I, props yeah. and stuff. Um, yeah, those are fun. So those that are getting into blades with the, or the one, there, there's more aspects to getting to being a, a bladesmith rather than just selling your wears a lot of it comes down to is making movie props you know and and you know you're not necessarily making a working blade you're making something that looks good you know on film is that correct oh yeah yeah they they're not edged never are they yeah. edged and it's all for show and you said a lot of times it's it's even what you see on film is, is paint yeah actually about 95 percent of what you see on film has been uh doctored with Airbrush. Yeah, we're not talking force and fire here. No, no, no. We're talking like <laughs> movies we're talking that movies, you go to the theaters sure. and watch or see on yeah. TV. So uh, that's cool, though. Yeah, it, it, it's fun, and I and I've done I've done a few pieces for local productions like the college and stuff like that. You know, they do a little on stage stuff. Yeah. But uh, I, I really get a kick out of it when you you get it on the big screen. That that's a big difference when you're seeing it on that versus a uh, play stage. Yeah, a theater. Mike. No movie props for me. No, no movie props, no, not yet, no. not yet. It's so, um, but you, you have made your knife. Uh, can we see it? Oh yeah, yeah. Let me grab it. Oh, it's right behind Is you. Right behind me. Yeah. Right under that red shirt over there. Oh yes. Okay. Now this isn't the sheath you said, right? No, no. That's just something I have laying around to bring it today. So you would chop a leg off or something yeah, floating yeah. around the pickup. Oh, it's sharp. No, I don't sharp anymore but yeah so what's what's the composition uh, there it's a uh, nitro v stainless uh, have you found the customers like that better than the real steel knives there's well i i just started so i started doing some kitchen knives and a couple other you know i still prefer high carbon yeah i mean i'll just be honest with you you know stainless is way harder to heat treat and i finally got my oven set up and everything so now i can do that um oh you mean the free oven you got for yes. when forge and fire from when, paragon yes you got Par a free oven yeah by my season season six was the last season the paragon offered that but they offered free and uh, completely on the down low some people heard about it some people didn't um if, but you, they if were, you won, if they won, they would offer you a free 18 inch or 24 inch Paragon oven. You got one too, mm -hmm. and then you sold it. Yeah, <laughs> Je Jesse's. Jesse's. Yeah, that's, oh, that's right. Yeah, and uh, so I finally got that set up and got you know the heat treat foil and cryo quench and stuff because after you know. So that's where the cryo. When everybody talks about cryo, is mainly for stainless. It's stainless. Yeah. Stainless yeah, it's all the stainless. It, it'll probably give you an extra. What maybe one or two points or something like that on the Rockwell 
really scale. Yeah, yeah. mostly the cryo stuff is for 5100. Too. You, you yeah, the really high carbon. Yeah, stuff. you wouldn't do much cryo work on 5160, 1095. It's, I wouldn't even think you'd cryo you work on any. You probably wouldn't get much out yeah. of it there, but the really high, the higher carbon steels and then the stainless stuff where, where you're you're taking all the martensite into austenite. Austinite to Martinsite. I never can remember yeah, which order I can't it remember, goes. But anyway, so you're probably getting about three more points on your stainless, and and also the curve, the toughness curve goes up a little bit too. Okay. But uh, anyway, I designed this one mainly just because you know it, me it meets a parameter. I think it's seven and a half, eight inch blade. Uh, and again, I think they had a ten inch minimum for the blade for length. Just cutting edge. Just cutting edge, okay. yeah, yeah, and then I've got the four and a half, five inch handle, or whatever, desert ironwood because of stuff. But I went stainless because for the longest time they were um, doing it on the island yeah. up there, up you there know, in, uh, in freaking Carnival Island. What is it called? Uh, Vancouver. Vancouver, yeah. I think it's Whidbey Island. I'm like, well, no, it's close. up there, but yeah. Yeah, no, the yeah, Vancouver yeah. capital of the world. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, with wolves, yeah, yeah, which is awesome. But uh, what I thought with all the rain and stuff, you know, I kind of, I'll try a little stainless, why not? Yeah. And then, and I saw some like rope cutting tests and things like that with some of the other stainless. And they're like, okay, 1095 cut sisal rope 80 times mm -hmm. before it goes. Well, these are like 400 times. Really? But you can't sharpen them. Yeah. Right, and so then I found this stainless that's kind of like the ABL stuff so you can still sharpen it out there but it's got and that's what jesse uses a lot is that a b jesse L loves that yeah this just has more um uh, vanadium in it just a little bit more vanadium and Ooh, vanadium and nitrogen it makes it shiny and i started you know this was way more robust i reground it a couple hundred times and but no it, it's pretty sweet so far yeah it's light it's uh, i the the scales now Traditionally, you wouldn't necessarily put that thin of scales on it, but to have weight reduction and, and it doesn't feel bad. It feels great. Kind of like. Yeah, yeah, I like. I mean, the yeah. thin scales is. You may reason look on like, wow, that's really thin. But then you put it in your hand and you're like, that's perfect. Uh, not bad. Yeah. You know, it's kind of weird because my scales have evolved into more of the Coke bottle. Yeah. I think you saw that. Uh -huh. um, you know, the I used scales. that technique on the knife that we made at your place. Yeah. 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 Very, very fits in the hand very nicely. Um, but a while back, there was kind of this trend to these way thinner scales uh -huh. and maybe a, a little bit wider this way on the knife. So then you didn't get it turning in your hand as much Yeah. because you had, you know, filled the hand more, I guess this way, vertically, mm -hmm. horizontally, ecumenically, <laughs> or whatever it is. But for this one, especially if you're if you're packing it around a lot, I thought you know maybe the the thinner scales would actually fit tighter to the body, Makes less, less chance of rolling, less chance. Well, I see it as also um, weight reduction because you're 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 yeah, you're, I mean, you're packing your house with you. I mean, wherever you go for this show. Or like, and, and those that haven't seen the show, Alone is basically the starving game. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, it's they're, they're going to put you in a place that, yes, you can survive, but not very healthily. You're not going to yeah. be a healthy individual. You're like eating pine bark and mice yeah. and slugs. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be the best, you know. If you found another person out there, I'd eat them too, you know. You're you know. Yeah, because... Yeah, because in some in some places, I mean, you have because you have to abide by the local hunting laws, and you know you could have food standing right in front of you, but you can't eat it, right? You know, and so um, because I it's for be it, it, I mean, it, I would. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, you, you know, you're not supposed to shoot a bear, so all you got to do is just bait yourself to where the bear attacks you, and then it's justifiable <laughs> to kill the bear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've I mean, got a bear this week. Your ass mauled, you know. Survival. And yeah. well, the biggest thing I've I've seen on the show <laughs> and anybody survival. going out there is that well, one of them, I can't remember what episode it was, um, but he had all this he had all this moose meat and was dying because it's so lean on the fat and the fat content. And so you need it you know, better, man. If you get out there, be There's careful, be creature. careful, brother. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. just don't be the well. You're yeah. not even gonna know if you're the first one. 
Right. You know, it's right. like it's like those guys that I must be the first one off, and they're like the last one there. Right. You know, it's like, dude, you no, they guys quit like day one. Yeah, but now yeah. just don't not to be not to be confused. The hundred days is not a stopping point. No, That's just no. your goal. Yeah. And you, if you and another still make it to that hundred days, you still keep going until one of you leaves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about taking a good knife, survivally, I'm sur Ah, we're thinking we're combining all kinds of words today. <laughs> Survivability of there you go. your of the individual is based upon, you know, whether you can cut, build, and kill. Right. And if you don't have a good knife, I, I don't understand why anybody doesn't take a bow. Well, there's some that don't. Right. When you're talking survival knife, a lot of us that's what we do. Um, that's originally what you started doing is making used worker knives, and you still do, but you because you don't care if people collect them. No. Not and really. I mean, and you don't even care if people use them. No, just as long as the checks don't bounce. The, yeah, as long as the checks don't bounce, <laughs> you know. But Mike and I are still in that. That should be a candy, Mike and I. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Mike, I guess Mike, Mike and, and I, I can, man. is. Yeah. Um, but um, survival just knives have been around candy. forever, and I and I think having. You making one, and then you making one that you're going to take on there. Hopefully, you cross your fingers. Hopefully, you yeah. get there. But um, I've been serving calories. <laughs> practicing that. Part. I think it's a cool, it's a great marketing tool. You know, especially you get on there and you and you do well, and and it's your knife, and um, it's not some Walmart special that, that looks cool on on your hip, but is absolutely freaking useless, like trackers. Oh, oh God. those are the stupidest <laughs> knives. They are cool, and they were cool. They were they're they're the coolest the looking coolest knives in the world, but they do not yeah. work at no. all. If you guys don't know what a tracker looks like, watch what is it, The Hunted, Hunted. with yeah. with uh, Benicio, Benicio del Toro and Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Jones. It was filmed in in Portland, Oregon, outside yeah. Portland, Oregon, out yeah. there in that temperate rainforest. Yeah. Um, Fake. Yeah, taking rebar and turning it into a. I think that's where you get your rebar joke from. All the time. Tom Brown tracker. Yeah. It's it's oh, so they are cool knives, but they are useless as tits on a board. Period. Well, and you know, here's the deal too, David. Um, I made this kind of as a prototype just to test the crap out of it. I mean, I've yeah. beaten the tar out of it, literally, just because I wanted to know what it. I yeah. don't want to get you out just there got and back have something with to it, break. Right? You yeah. just got back yeah. hunting. Yeah, and processed an elk with it and all that good stuff, you know. So I wanted to know that it would actually one work yeah two not break and three that i can sharpen it out there yeah on a rock because you don't get anything else and those are ironwood scales so these you're not wood, you're not so. necessarily get it be wary about you know slapping the the, the palm no, on no. them because that's some hard stuff no that's hard dense wood you don't have to worry about oiling it because yeah. it's already oiled and so you know yeah all that stuff but david here he was showing, showing me his and he he made his with removable scales yeah so, so if the guy wanted to turn that into a spear and go hunting or whatever that's, that's it was. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty so genius. Under, and I'm underneath, like, hmm. there's uh, a lot more holes to be able to put paracord through so you can tie it on. So you, so you could take the knife, split, and then put your knife in there and run, yeah. tie it on like So one of, the, one of the ten tools that this individual was taking was a Leatherman, and that was permissibly was allowed. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I put uh, flathead screws through it, and so that way you can take the scales apart. Corby bolts. Corby bolts, yeah. yep. And then that way you've got uh, kind of two tools in one. That's, and then also there's a hammer yeah. on the end, and there's a uh, bark scraper uh, at the at the front of the ricasse. So there, there's, I Swiss yeah. Army that thing as much as I could. Yes. Yeah. Now, we, we just got done doing our buck knife challenge, hunter slash camp knives. Um, four of us competed. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, smoked out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one thing that came became very apparent with those knives is that um, to be a survival knife, a wild wild man knife, what do you want to call it, a lone knife, doesn't matter. Yeah. You have you cannot round the back of your spine, and that's something that 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 you did, I did. The only one that didn't do it was Mr. David Spurlock. Spurlock, yeah. You know, um, you want that right angle, at least on one side or one part somewhere on that spine so that yeah. you can you can strike a ferro rod. Yeah. Well, one of the most famous knives are the Mora knives. You know, they're dirt cheap, they're good knives, and their blades are about that long. And 
small and all that stuff. And they come with a rounded knife, but almost all of the survival people that do that take and, and flatten at least yeah. an inch, maybe two of that, so it's a nice 45s. So you can get a good, good rod. strike. Yeah. And that, that's, that's one of the issues with stainless, is it'll strike a ferro rod okay, but if you lose that rod and you have to go out and find flint and steel, won't it, it won't act as the steel. And so... Is that because is it, is it softer or, is it, or is it, it's just a different uh, alloy? Just a different alloy, yeah. yeah. You, you need that high carbon and you need it pretty brittle. So the higher carbon, like 5100, 1095, and if it's kind of brittle, so when you spark it... So even 5160 is too, it'll, too much it'll chromium kinda, content in it? It'll kind of do it, but it's... You want what it's doing is it's literally shaving off a small piece of that steel and, and, igniting. and igniting the car, yeah. And that just takes carbon to, yeah. to so ignite that. So, what about uh, keeping the stainless so it's less like maintenance, right? Don't worry about a rust on this stuff out there. What kind of doing like a sand mile with that high carbon like that? Because it's fine, like a small section. I thought of doing that too. Did you yeah, have I'm experience with uh, now? What I don't know if they heard you on here, was it? Uh, he was asking, he was talking about maybe taking a sand mile of stainless. Over top of a high carbon just core, a, a he was saying the small opposite, piece. even. Like yeah. just like oh, the opposite. insert in the spine, like a sand mine style. Because like you have done sand of... stainless over high carbon. Yeah. That, uh, well, that little knife over there is stainless over high carbon. The one that you made for Rick, is that also stainless over high carbon? That is. That, that is sand mine. It is. I think. No, it's, it's 15 and 20. It's 15 and 20. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a, it is a rustable carbon. Yeah. Little group thing was pretty cool getting all you guys here again we answered a lot of questions that i get to have answered all the time but not necessarily anybody else gets to you know hear the you know the good and the bad and you know obviously david having some bad experiences on tv stuff and mike having of course you don't really care <laughs> yeah but yeah it's still cool yeah i mean it is it's, hey it's i got cool. it's i all, got i got free Free, free trips. It's all when it comes right down to it, though. It's it's all marketing. I mean, it, what what it helps you out is as a as a bladesmith, it helps you market your yourself because, and Mike's already there. David's already there. I have a few clients where I'm there at. Um, is that they're they're not buying the a knife anymore. They're buying the name. They're buying the Mike Rowley, the David Roder, the Nathan Thompson. And like I have very, I have maybe two or three clients that they don't they don't really care what it is they just want the, the next available piece they don't care if they, they don't even use it but that's they're just buying the name and um this is where using these tv shows alone they're using forged and fire um even getting your um going through uh abs getting uh journeyman and master it's all it all becomes down boils down to marketing so we're gonna um we're gonna let these guys go. We're gonna go out and eat some good food. Maybe screw around the shop for a little bit more. I don't think the food's ready yet. And um, have a little fun. All right, everybody. Awesome.